Good evening, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started um, at promptly at 6 o'clock because it looks like we have a lot of people who uh, have input. So if I can get everybody to take their seat and um, finish up your conversations, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Pam Lean, and I'm the Deputy Mayor of the City of Palmer. Uh, I just want to start out with uh, the conversation that um, this was a citizen-led effort uh, to bring awareness to something that's growing and happening within our uh, city, and that would be what we call vagrancy or homelessness, but with a with a um, acute tone to it. So, um, a couple of uh, meetings ago, we had several citizens that uh, basically had come and, and uh, said, "Hey, we we got to have some help." So, this really this this is really about a conversation amongst the public and people who have. Um, want to have input and skin in the game in order to help solve for these issues, but with compassion and um, ideas and motivation in order to help come up with ideas and solutions and maybe collectively um, come together and uh, work on this issue. So um, first off, I'd like to uh, actually have our some of our elected officials I see are in the audience, so I'd like them to stand up and and I'd be recognized, Delena. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> so, uh, Representative uh, Delena Johnson is here. We just want to recognize her. Thank you. And Stephanie Nowers. Fantastic. Thank you. And of course, uh, Todd Smolden is here on behalf of the governor. And then uh, we have Brian Endel. Yeah. Go ahead and you just. <laughs> It's just a candidate. Um, so, uh, and then of course, uh, we'll go ahead and do introductions starting with Brad. Um, just introduce I, yourself, Brad. Yeah, hi. I'm, uh, I'm the acting city manager right now. Mr. Moosey's out of town, so I'm here to listen and hear your concerns. Thank you. Richard Best, I'm on Palmer City Council. Tom Ojula, a member of uh, Palmer City Council. Carolina Anzalotti, I'm on the Palmer City Council. Josh Shooter with the Palmer City Council. Fantastic. So we want to start off with um, asking for uh, the public to come forward with some of their experiences. Um, we actually have handheld mics, and if you would like to participate and talk about some of those experiences, we'll bring that out to you. Um, we're first going, to, we, we want to raise awareness, so we first want to hear from you about some of your experiences. And then we want to go into what we will call a problem solving or um, ideas session in order to help resolve for this issue. So we're just going to get right into it. So if you don't mind raising your hand, um, we'll, we'll come at you. Hi, my name is Craig Thorne. Uh, I own two commercial, three commercial buildings, but two right downtown at the corner of the four-way flashing light. Uh, I have tenants in there, obviously. The school district is one of those. Um, and also, more than Lily, the lady store, I guess you would call it. Guys, it's not for us, but it's, it's a nice store. Uh, Kelly is the owner of that. Um, she came up to me, oh, several weeks ago, probably about the time that uh, she might have been one of the ones at the city council. 
and said, we have a problem. And folks, we have a problem. We really do. Uh, there's a lot of homeless people downtown, vagrants. Um, most of it appears to be mental health issues. We can talk about the solutions to that later, but um, it's it's become very, and I spend quite a bit of time in, in downtown Palmer. I live in Wasilla, I work in Wasilla, but um, I'm in Palmer a lot. And it's, uh, I guess at this point, I'll just say it is a problem. We'll talk about solutions later. So there's my two cents. Hi, my name is Danny Witsack. I've lived in Palmer for about 10 years. Um, when we first moved here, there really was no, um, I mean, a few vagrants maybe, but it wasn't a huge problem. Now my um, teenagers who run for Palmer High School report um, that when they run with their team through the woods by Palmer High, um, they encounter dozens of homeless people back there doing drugs. <laughs> So this, to me, is a big problem for our youth and the safety of our kids in the community. So that's where I see the problem. Hi, I'm not going to stand up. My name is Lori Kopenberg. I have Vagabond Blues and Purple Moose. We've had instances, my goodness, going on for the last probably five years at least. We've um, totally trespassed people off of our property, not only at Purple Moose, but also in the Kozlowski Center. Some of the things with Purple Moose, we have young girls that work there. And if you guys recall what happened with the young girl at the coffee shop in Anchorage, that's always a huge concern. A few months ago, we did have um, a gentleman try to break into our Purple Moose building. It was probably about 2.30 in the morning. I do have an alarm system on there, and it is very loud. You can hear it across town, which thankfully is a good thing. Um, I do have a picture of the guy trying to break in. But as soon as the alarm went off, of course, he, he ran. Um, thankfully, Palmer police responded quickly. The officer on duty did climb through our window to ensure that there was nobody in the building. My husband went down, and we secured the property again. However, it's a nightly occurrence, and we do have cameras, so we can see a lot what happens. We see him come down. It's usually at nighttime, about 12 and between 12 and 5, 12 and 6 in the morning. They come from the hotel there on the other side of Fred Myers. I can see all the way up to the light. I can refine my search and see that bar. So you see them go across to cars, and they walk their way down, and they go back and forth. So it is an issue. Um, again, I've seen so many instances of where there's a lot of, um, they're running from things when they're um, trying to break into other locations in that area. At Vagabond this morning, we just had a guest about 6.30 come in and tell us that there was a guy passed out in the bathroom, legs hanging out through that. So sometimes they come in at not, during the day, and they find a place to hide. And after the buildings close, they, you know, they go in the bathroom and they sleep. And again, my concern is I have nightly bakers. I have young girls that are working there until 7 or 8 at night. Um, so these are issues that need to be dealt with, and the number of needles, and the amount of cleanup that happens every spring is pretty tremendous. When my gardener goes out to clean up our, our gardens at Purple Moose, she finds a lot of uh, remnants of that. So it is an ongoing situation. I do believe they have drops. Um, we saw some activity happen where we watched one gentleman come up and drop something in our outside garbage can. And then shortly after, another person came and took something out of that garbage can. So that to us seemed pretty questionable. So it's time for Palmer to step up and do something. I think we have to make them uncomfortable in what they're doing. And that means a daily visit to wherever they are um, camping at because they're comfortable. They're all right with what they're doing. And it's winter time and they're gonna start coming in more and more and more. So uh, I'm sure as, as other people talk, I will remember other things and have other comments about solutions, but it is a situation for safety of Palmer and the public. Thank you. I'm Ronalee Moses. I own Peak Boutique downtown in Palmer. Um, for We've had a couple of situations. I mean, some of them happened a year or two ago. One was a customer came in when I had one employee, female employee there on a Saturday by herself, and he went in and locked himself in our employees only bathroom. And I'm not sure what exactly was happening in there, but it was a big mess was made there. Um, we have an entrance to our 
our business. There's a main one because there's some offices upstairs. Usually the person that closes remembers to lock the door. There was one night where they didn't lock the door and we had an individual go into the bathroom up there and destroy the bathroom. The messes that are left behind, it's sometimes it's a hazard waste situation. Um, there have been situations, I'm not sure if anyone from CarQuest is here. They're the business right next to mine. They have a storage, um, outdoor storage area. It's right across from the Eagle on that street. They, somebody kicked the door in and camped in there for a few nights and the Things that were left behind were a, a big problem. The police actually showed up when the guy was still in there and they, they removed him from the premises. Um, last night, um, driving up kind of by Fred Meyer on the corner, there was a person that just laid down in a sleeping bag to sleep on the side of the road in the grass. I mean, there's, it's a huge crisis. There's a lot of different things going on. I mean, we've had one situation a few years ago where, and it's an individual that's well known in Palmer. Um, he's, he usually, isn't much of an issue, but when he's not having a good day, everyone up and down the street knows because he's shouting and yelling at people, and he is a very threatening presence. A lot of times, he is carrying things like trees or sticks that look like something the Grim Reaper would carry. Um, one particular situation, I was downstairs at my shop working in the basement area. I had the door open in the back, and I just heard shouting and screaming out in the back parking lot, and so I was like, what in the world is going on out there? I came upstairs and I just, I saw him walking toward the Eagle Motel and he was just yelling about how he was going to kill somebody. He was going to hold her down until her heart stopped beating and saying all kinds of terrible things. And I was like, wow, I need to go grab my phone and call the police. I get around to the other side of the building and the police are already there. So I figured the situation was already resolved and then come to find out it was, um, it ended up being a court case and things like that. But this individual is still here in Palmer. He's still troubled. I don't know what resources are available to them. I hope there's something that can be done because that particular person, it's going to end up being a situation where somebody feels like they need to defend himself and he gets hurt or he ends up hurting someone else. So right now, from a business standpoint, I'm concerned about the safety of my employees and of my customers. I have customers and vendors that are afraid to come into the building when certain people are on the sidewalks because they don't want to cross the path of them because of the outbursts and everything else that are happening. I have vendors that have to unload things, and it's the same thing with them. So if you, it's not just safety from customer standpoint. It also impacts our ability to do our businesses and things like that, too. So I'm not sure what the solution is. I'm hoping we can figure out at least different ways to approach the different levels of problems that we're seeing. But they're, they're very real, and it's going to escalate if we don't address some of them. Yeah, my name is Mike Coons. I did a little, did a little searching. Uh, vagrancy is a Class C misdemeanor, uh, up to five thousand dollar fine. Uh, I'm not really sure how much time in jail, maybe a month. The question I've got, you know, and and, and just listening to this short little bit I've, I've been hearing, is it sounds like we've got district attorneys in our legal system that is completely either totally apathetic to what's going on, don't give a damn at the worst, and just let, letting these people go. This is, this is not San Francisco. This is not L.A. This is not Chicago. This is not even Anchorage. This is Palmer. You know, the, the, the lady's comment was absolutely right on. Sooner or later, somebody's going to break and enter, and somebody's going to be on the other side of that door with a gun. And they're going to get shot. And that's going to be, that's the bottom line. And the person that had to pull that trigger, their life is completely changed forever. I'm not worried about, I'm going to be very blunt. I'm not worried about the person that broke into the house that got shot. I'm poor worried about that poor potential victim now has to live, live with the fact that they shot and put somebody six feet under. That's what I'm really worried about. I feel sorry more for them than anything else. Um, defecating in public. The bodily fluid situations. I'm a retired paramedic. So I know about HIV AIDS. I know about hep B. Now we've got monkey pox. Oh my God. So we got all these different things that are going on. That's a public health violation. So what we need to be looking at is that all of the above. We need to go after the DA and the legal system and the public health system for not doing their job. That's the bottom line. And then I, lastly, 
is I've see, been reading where people are being bussed in here from Anchorage. I want to be I want to be blunt. Let's do a Governor Abbott. Let's do a Governor DeSantis. Put these people on a bus, take them into Anchorage, drop them off in the front steps of, of uh, uh, Constant and those other people in the assembly's front doors and let them have the problem back. I just want to remind everybody that we're looking for experiences that we're having in Palmer right now, and uh, we'll move into kind solutions and documenting what thought processes are in order to work through these issues. Um, so just, just a quick note on that, okay? Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Claire. Um, I'm a receptionist um, in the city of Palmer, and um, I, I haven't been a receptionist except for a few years, and um, I, I, many, many years ago, I lived in Anchorage, and I, I did government work there as well. And Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a receptionist for the city of Palmer. Um, but I've worked in government in Anchorage. I worked at the DMV on Benson, and I worked at the library, um, LUSAC, so I've had a lot of experience with people who are in some kind of crisis, whether it's mental health crisis or drug abuse crisis, or they're just they're looking for some place to be warm, or find some place to you know where they can use the facilities. Um, and I've seen some some people do some pretty awful things um, in Anchorage. Um, having said that, my experience is here. Um, when we open back up to the public, most of my experiences, pretty much all of my experiences, have been people coming in looking for resources. They don't know where to go. They don't know what's available. They have no way of contacting people. They have little to no support system. They're lonely and scared, and a lot of them are experiencing a crisis of some kind, whether it's mental health or drug abuse and substance abuse, and a lot of them want help. Um, a lot of them have come to me and, and come into City Hall, and sometimes they just stay and want to talk so that they can get warm in the middle of winter. And... Um, a lot of times they'll ask me what's available in the valley, what's available in Palmer, and the, um, the answer I usually give them is, you know, most of the resources are in Wasilla, and that's a 12-mile hike in negative 10 weather in the middle of winter. Um, there's a bug. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No. Um, anyway, so that's, I mean, most of, my, most of my experiences is people who are looking for shelter, they're looking for help, they're looking for the resources that are available, um, any way that they can get in contact with that. Um, they're looking for any transportation options because we have no transportation infrastructure. Um, our transportation infrastructure is, anyway, I'm sorry, that's later. Um, it, it's such that it's um, demand, I don't know how many people have looked at the uh, public transportation we have, which is, which is awesome, but it's demand response. You have to call 24 hours in advance and make a reservation to be able to go anywhere. Um, for, to do that, you have to have a phone. You have to know where you're going and where the resources are. And if you don't know 24 hours in advance, you might not be able to get one. Even if you do know, you might not be able to get a ride. Um, another experience I've had are, um, you know, I know that the gentleman that you're talking about, gentleman, he's, he's around City Hall a lot. We know him. <laughs> we know a lot of the people who come around City Hall and um, the places they, they typically stay looking for shelter. Um, I also know there have been people who have been picked up for trespassing. Um, an issue there I've seen is, um, you know, talking with people and talking with people in the court system who've been dealing with this. Um, a lot of these people, they'll try to find shelter. They'll try to find a place that they can stay, and it's considered trespassing. Um, a police officer will serve them and let them know when their court date is, but they need a phone in order to be able to attend court for their hearing. If they miss that, they're picked up. Um, and if they're picked up, that doesn't really help them get out of the situation they're in. It just perpetuates the cycle. They're going to get out, and they're going to be, if they have fines, they're going to be in debt. They aren't going to be able to pay their fines. It's, it's just going to keep happening. So, yes. Um, anyway, um, that's, that's most of my experiences. Um, I know there's been a lot of, you know, scary experiences. There's been a lot of people who are experiencing a crisis, and they don't know, you know, they have no one who will be able to go and, give them help or, you know, they don't know how to ask for help. Um, and that's scary for everyone involved. It's scary for us um, who, you know, see them and don't know how to help them. And it's scary for them because they have to live with it. 
and they are just lost. So those are most of my experiences. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Felicity. I work at Valley Neighborhood Dental here in Palmer. Um, one of my experiences was with, I just want to say, a person. Um, a person who is valuable and who is making bad decisions, but that's, it's part of life. And I could be the same way, honestly. Um, but with that being said, I would just like to say, speaking on behalf, I am a young woman, obviously, um, and I feel very unsafe um, in several situations. And in one situation, I did call the police department um, from a particular person who was in our parking lot who was thrashing and yelling um, and being a threat to my patients that were coming in. Um, and it was a bit frightening. Um, but with that being said, I was very thankful for the help that the police department offered um, and just, you know, explaining the situation and handling it very well and professionally um, and making him feel like a person and not just like somebody that needs to be kicked out constantly. Um, but there were definitely strict boundaries set there. So um, my goals and hopes for solutions would be somewhere that these people could go and gain help and not just keep being kicked out of somewhere, but have somewhere that can be a refuge and that they can heal properly. Um, that's my wish. My name is Jackie Goforth, and my granddaughter and I love the playground. Yeah. Yeah, at the amusement, is it called the amusement park? The wooden one, the moose, the moose what? Yeah, the amusement, okay. And uh, about two months ago, we were playing on there, and on the back left corner where the spiral slide is, there, it, the place was full of kids, and it was rainy, thank goodness. But there were feces on the side of one of the areas and the trail of toilet paper, okay? And all I could do was kick it aside, but there were children everywhere. And I took pictures and sent them to Pam. Maline, because this is a serious issue with all these children in this biological product. Thank you. And we do have some pictures up here that are referenced. We tried not to, uh, you know, have faces of anybody. We don't, we don't want names named. But we do have some, just some small um, pictures of experiences and things like that that we've, that we've received. Uh, there's plenty more, but that's just a few of them. So. My name is Jesse. I'll uh, got a few things that I'll keep it short here. Uh, our experiences that we live over in the neighborhood behind cars, our experiences is people walking to and from what we have to only consider access to drug and alcohol because they're walking one way and they're coming back the next and then sneaking into the woods. They're not doing too much sneaking. They're pretty much in the open. Uh, the woods there between cars and, oops. Oh, the, the woods between cars there, uh, filled with needles, and we're constantly picking it up. We've had thieves, had people walk right up into our driveway and take stuff, had people knocking on the door, pretending to sell something, oh, or asking for somebody, oh, they're not here, you know, when we answer the door. We don't know what happens, what we do now, so we have cameras. But before that, you know, it sounds like they're looking to see if anybody's home so they could walk off with stuff. Problems, city's too small to solve all these problems. We can't arrest people because it costs money. Put them in jail, not doing anything. Giving them treatment, well, there's programs out there already. So, you know, what attracts these people? What attracts the homeless to our area? We need to find, address that, and maybe if we can eliminate what, what attracts these homeless to our area, we might be able to eliminate some of these problems in that manner. Alcohol, constantly seeing alcohol uh, being consumed in our neighborhood, in beer bottles, in our lawns, and our, it's not just beer, but everything. How are they getting this access? Is alcohol restriction an idea, or is it already so tight that we can't go anything more? The police are overwhelmed. They can't 
They can't arrest every single call and every single vagrant. Uh, businesses themselves are, has once in a while responded when we've talked to it. Most of the time it's myself or one of the neighbors going in, pulling the camp stuff out and getting rid of it. But they return a couple of days to a week later. So we need to find some kind of access to community response along with the businesses that we can remove these things and again, remove the attraction to being in Palmer. <clears throat> what was my other note? That's pretty much about it. I mean, I think it's community involvement, not police involvement, community involvement, young men, old men, young ladies, old ladies, getting involved whether it's neighborhood watch or are we helping cleaning up? But we need to remove the attraction to this place. I'm Rex Malcolm, uh, one of the dentist owners of uh, Valley Neighborhood Dental Center, and I'll, I'll keep it kind of short because we, we got plenty of examples here of people having issues with what's going on in our town, and obviously it's, uh, there's a strong mental health component to it, but um, you know, I don't know what resources Palmer has available, but that's kind of where it needs to be attacked from, addressing mental health, and um, from a safety standpoint, you know, I'm... I fear for my staff every time they take the garbage out because where our office is at, the garbage has to be taken around the back of the building. And they always make comments about if I'm not back in 10 minutes, come looking for me. And they're not kidding. So. Hello, my name is Wes Hartz. I am the owner of the Palmer Bar. Or me and my cousin should be here in a minute. He's also the owner. Um, just to let you know, as a business owner, I'm kind of on, on Main Street. I'm on the front lines of this. I am watching all the time. Um, I've been bringing this to the community council for a while. Um, it's not, there is a few people that are looking for help. It's, there is a group out there that are pushing it and are feeling emboldened by the new ones that are showing up on um, trying to hustle people down. Even some of the street people are scared of the aggressive component that are there looking for help. And it's not, we come, I've come across a few that are looking for help, but the major issue in Palmer is the ones that are aggressive that are not actually looking for help. That's becoming the major issue downtown. Um, it shouldn't have to be that for, as a business owner, for me to protect my employees, the only thing I can do is trespass them. After trespassing, we had one gentleman that would stand right at the property line and yell at the bar, uh, right out 15 feet away from the front of the building. The thing is, is one of the girls got a restraining order against him. He now knows who got a restraining order against him. It's not just the building and that she felt threatened. All my staff feels threatened. I need a little bit more power as a business owner protecting my employees. Um, the fact that they're calling me going, I'm being watched from across the street. And this is the fifth night that he watches. And then he moves around to the backside after they close the blinds on the front of the building and watches them walk to their cars. That's an issue. That's stalking but unless she turns in paperwork to the police and he's notified that he has a restraining order against this one of my bartenders then he's more likely to step up the es and escalate the stalking of her so okay i just kind of give you an idea it's really bad um and some of the pictures are some of the pictures that i sent to pam um we just need to think of what we can do it's the aggressive ones. It's not the ones that are falling through the crack, even though there's a few of them. And we need to get the information out where they can get help. But we have to have something more aggressive dealing with the, aggressor, the aggressive ones that know the law. Because as soon as they see the cops, the cops are, the Palmer police are doing a wonderful job. They're up trying to make contact face to face. I've seen Pam going up and having conversations and interacting with these people. 
Um, but there's a few that are aggressive. They don't want help. They want to intimidate people. They want to do drugs, uh, even though they have mental illnesses. They're just, they don't want the system. And so here you go. Thank you. All right. So I will, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and take one more, um, and then we're going to go right into um, talking about some solutions and ideas and uh, how to make those connections, just as um, many of you have said, what are the resources? How do we, how do we, how do we connect people um, to these resources? Hi, my name is Cherie Crippen. I've lived in the Valley a little over 30 years, and 15 of that was actually inside uh, the city limits close to Palmer High School. Now, I'm not a business owner downtown, but I certainly frequent all these businesses, and I kind of look at it as an economic challenge for you, too, because what happens when you lose your customers? I mean, the whole city dies when something like that happens. Um, I never expected to sit in my chiropractor's office, who is right next to your <laughs> drive-in coffee shop, and get a bird's eye view of behavior on the corner there. It's, it's, you know, kind of intimidating. But as a sidebar, I kind of want to warn you now, because I, I don't live inside the city limits, our neighborhood has a well house because we're on a community well. And one year we found somebody who had literally moved in there, he had a sleeping bag, had a little table, an alarm clock, had a little lamp. We have no idea how long he was been there, and, and the only reason we found out was that the, the well needed maintenance. So if they come in and, and feel like they belong and it's theirs, you're going to have a bigger problem later. So the people who need help, we need to help, and those who need some, some mental help, um, there's got to be a solution for them. They, they can't just ruin our town. Thank you. So we do recognize that this probably is not going to be the only conversation that we're going to have. There's got there's got to be a lot more um, conversations about solutions and making connections. It's probably just going to be a, 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 a joint wide effort, um, whether it's a steering committee or a, um, a committee of uh, folks that are willing to take this on. Um, that's what we're looking at. So um, we're going to go ahead and pop into solutions. Um, but in the meantime, I would like to ask Chief Shelton to kind of give some statistics. I, I asked him to prepare some statistics on uh, what he deals with on a daily basis. And so if you can go ahead and uh, pop your microphone on and give us your statistics. <laughs> All right. So can everybody hear me OK in the back? All right. I got a thumbs up back there. So when I was looking at stats, it sounds like it'd be easy. We have a CAD program. It sounds like it'd be really easy to mine the information. I want to give a little bit of background when I pull stats. Um, say, for example, trespass. When you pull a trespass, it might be homeless people, but it might also be, you know, somebody breaking into a car or into a a home, it could be a neighborhood kid, you know, maybe going around rattling doors. So to be able to separate those out, short of going through every single case, it can be a little bit uh, arduous, I guess you might say. And primarily we see three or four different calls that we deal with that are um, associated with the homeless. That would be criminal trespass, public assist. In other words, a business owner calling and just want somebody to move along or having a question on how to keep their uh, employees safe, that sort of thing. Um, other calls may be shoplifting and disturbances. Um, those are kind of our primary ones. The easiest or the one that is most likely or the majority of them deal with the homeless, is trespass. In this year so far, we've had 138 calls regarding tres trespasses. And then last year, from January 1st, 2021 to December 31st, 2021, we had a total of 158. The ones this year, that was from January this year to... Till today. 
I pulled up some of our local home, homeless people that are frequent flyers, the ones that actually lived here in Palmer. And we identified nine of them that we deal with on a regular, regular basis. Overall, there's about 40 homeless people that we deal with on any given day. But these nine are ones probably that you, that you guys see around town quite a bit. We've contacted uh, one of those individuals 192 times since uh, January of 2021. Another one 177, another 174. The next closest one was 147, then 125, and then they dropped down to double digits, 68, 60, 47, and 21. These nine individuals created a total of 1,011 calls since January of 20, uh, excuse me, 2021. I wish I was able to get a little bit better picture of all the types of calls and be able to, but it's just, it's just too, too hard to, to mine at this point because we don't have a code that we can put in there that says homeless or a way to identify and separate those out. Needless to say, we've been at least twice a day we're dealing with vagrancy in some sort of fashion. Deputy Mayor Malin, is there anything Thank else? you. I appreciate that. Um, all right. Well, let's move into solutions and ideas and um, what, what you might be thinking. I'm Chris Herberger. I own the business directly behind the dental office, so we share that alleyway. So if I just want to offer a solution that I can do for you guys, I am there, I'm sure, you're, when your guys are open. So if you ever feel afraid, you can come into my office. Okay? I am in that, I mean, to get into my business, you have to be in that alleyway. So I know that dumpster. When I hear people in the dumpster, I say, hi, let them know that you're there. Um, I walk a lot in this town. So I know the people you're talking about. I say hi. I make eye contact with them. The guy might be screaming at me. I just keep going. But I acknowledge him and make him feel that he is a human being. And that one guy that he was in front of my office, the utilities is all in front of my office, he was out there playing with the rocks, putting them everywhere, making little piles. He left. I went home. I live and work in downtown Palmer. And he did like a 180. He was talking to the rocks. And then when I saw him walking home, he asked me for $2. It was like he wasn't crazy anymore. He was like a person needing a hand. So, but anyway. For my solution for to help you guys, I'm right behind you. I'm there a lot. So if you ever feel threatened back there, just walk in. And Drum Data Services, the one with the garage. And there's a person that actually lives in the other house there. So she, that kind of helps too because she's there. She lives there. So there's always, I think, somebody going to be in that alleyway for you guys. Hi, my name is Jessica Young. I work at Fireside Books, so middle of downtown. I deal with lots of people every day, and a lot of the local homeless population know that we're a safe place to come get warm, get a bottle of water, call whoever you need. So I've dealt with a lot of these people. Also, like Chris, I was a pedestrian for years until recently, um, too anxious to get my driver's license. <laughs> and so I've encountered all of these people on the street. I've spoken to them. And I think your main solution is to stop othering them. Stop saying, these people are ruining our town. These people, these people, they're our people. They're human beings. 
if you've never heard the phrase there but for the grace of God go I, maybe think on that because it is much easier to get in that situation than you think it is, especially if you have mental health problems in a state and in a country that has no services. There are no services in Palmer. I have had to arrange rides to get people to Wasilla to get them into treatment. Took a, a lot of doing when I don't drive. <laughs> there is just nothing. There's no transportation, which I know as a pedestrian. There's no place to get warm unless they can hike all the way up the Palmer Wasilla to the Salvation Army Warming Center, which is only open when it is already killing cold outside. Can you imagine sitting outside when it is 15 below waiting for them to open with no shelter? So just, just think about that. They are human beings. Think about what you would do in that situation and that you would want compassion. I know some of them are unpleasant to deal with. I know some of them clearly need help, but cycling them in and out of the jail system does no good. We need to treat them like humans and help them, help them the way we would want to be helped if we were in that situation. Thank you. I'm just gonna um, give quick, uh, let, let Todd, before he has to leave, Todd Smolden from the governor's office. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Todd Smolden. I work for the governor in the Matsu Valley and I just wanted to, I'm sorry I have to leave a little early because of family commitment, but um, just to give you a quick, kind of overview of some things that are happening. Uh, one is as, as part of the People First Initiative, uh, we have a, a homelessness task force that is going to be reporting to the governor very soon um, on some potential solutions. That's more of a statewide uh, thing that we're working on. Um, but locally, uh, there is a group of us who are also having uh, a meeting, uh, meetings, a homelessness task force that um, is, uh, is kind of sponsored by the Matsu Health Foundation, but uh, the, the group of us who are meeting include uh, uh, Michelle Overstreet with my house and other providers in the area. So um, there is a lot of talk about this uh, that's happening already in the Matsu uh, around transportation, around uh, how do we provide services for the bulk of of the visible population that's experiencing substance abuse or mental health uh, issues. I really appreciated your comments, uh, some of your comments about how this could very well be you or your, or your brother or your mother or your cousin. And personally, I experienced two weeks of homelessness myself uh, at 19 in Kodiak. So um, it, it really can happen to anyone. Um, so just, I just wanted to let you know that, that there are some things happening in the Matsu, people talking about these things. And, and working on some solutions. And I know that the city of Palmer, I, this is great that you're having this conversation as well because um, I don't want to offend Anchorage, but we, we don't want to be Anchorage, right? So, and so the, the only way we can make sure that happens is if we take a proactive approach uh, that is compassionate um, but also um, really does seek, seek some solutions. So uh, and again, anyway, I apologize I have to leave, but I did leave some cards with, uh, with uh, uh, Councilwoman Moline, so if anybody wants to reach out to me, she can uh, get that for you. So thank you. My name is Polly Beth Odom. I'm the executive director of Daybreak Incorporated, and we are located in Palmer. We have been in Palmer for 35 years. We started out by providing housing for individuals who li uh, live with a mental illness. It was known as Daybreak Apartments. It's now Garden View. But we provide case management services to individuals. Now, I can't serve everybody, right? But we're there. I try to make sure that we're good business partners because in the building we're at, there's a lot of other businesses. So I try to be thoughtful about the people who are coming in and getting help. But what I want to do is to be able to help to be part of the solution. You know, sometimes we have to think about things like NIMBY, right? Nobody wants to have a, a facility next to their business because that might cause another problem. But I want to be part of the solution. I just wanted to let you know that we're here. I understand some of the people that you're working with or that you're seeing. And we work with the mental health court. We work with returning citizens. Again, I'm not going to be able to solve everything. I'm really hoping that with my house that we can come up with some good ideas of what we can do moving forward. But we're out there. There are agencies that do want to help. Um, 
call, I might not have the answer, but I always tell my staff, if you know somebody who needs help, call. I'll help to see how we can get them connected. I just wanted to make sure you knew that we were there. Yeah. We don't, oh, we don't have, so we are case manage, we provide mental health case management. Still very effective, thank you. Um, I'm going to try and organize my thoughts. I'm sorry. Um, I, I appreciate what you said about, um, you know, looking at this from the perspective of the fact that these are, these are people, these are human lives in our community. They're part of our community. Um, so I believe it's our job, um, and our responsibility to be uplifting and to look at it from a compassionate perspective. Um, a very wonderful and loving lady I know, um, says that, you know, there will always be people as a part of our society that need help. That's just a fact of life. Things happen. Um, people face challenges that they don't know how to deal with. And um, for some people, you know, they might have family. They might have a connection out here, but that family can get burnt out um, dealing with it by themselves. Um, I, I believe that it's not just one issue, it's, it's a lot of issues. There's a lot of need and there's a lot of um, people who don't know how to get the help they need. And there are a lot of people who, yeah, they might not want help. Um, uh, one big issue is a lack of affordable housing. I don't know how many of you have looked at rentals lately. There are none. And they are, when they do come up, there's a line of 50 applicants for each one. And they are exorbitant prices. I know if I was, I'm very blessed to have a place to live. If I did not, I would not be able to afford a place to live. And more than one time I've been near, my husband and I have been near homelessness because I simply did not make enough money to afford a new place to live. Um, and we have a support system and I am, we are very blessed that we have a support system who could help us out temporarily until we could find a place to live. Um, I believe a solution to that, um, and actually I've spent the last week um, trying to talk to the people who are involved with the amazing resources that do exist in the valley. Um, Polly, um, with Daybreak, she is, they're, they're in downtown Palmer, um, and she does amazing work with people who uh, have mental health crisis. Um, I talked a lot with um, Ginger and Nancy at Family Promise. Um, they help specifically families in the context of a parent and child. There must be at least a parent and child. Um, they partner with congregations around Matsu. And what happens is, is you can go and you can go to the congregation. You can stay there. They'll help you transition into permanent housing. They'll help you if you need to find a job, if you need transportation, which, I mean, let's face it, it's, it's the valley. If you live even remotely outside of the city, you have a hike to get anywhere. Um, and half the year, that's just not a viable option, especially with anyone who faces physical disabilities or limitations. Um, if you've tried to walk down the sidewalk and it's not graded, you can slip and nearly fall into the street. And that's on a good case scenario, not if you have a walker or anything like that. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, issues. So if there's a lack of affordable housing, then I believe a solution is um, to create more affordable housing. Um, there are lots of people who have talked about the idea of, and actually um, uh, Don Young uh, was a supporter of it, as well as um, uh, Lisa Murkowski was a supporter of um, an idea of groupings of tiny homes. I don't know if any of you have looked at tiny homes, they're basically, you know, bigger than a shed, smaller than an apartment, but they're individual structures that function well for transitional housing, they're affordable, they're easier to build, and they're not the large um, apartment buildings that a lot of people really don't want to see. Um, a lot of people don't want those in the city that I've talked to, but tiny home villages are a popular thing. Um, uh, another uh, issue is a place to go during the day for a lot of these people. I mean, that's how we end up with you know, people who are facing homelessness or people who are facing issues um, end up in a situation where they have no place to go. They have no, no place to connect them to resources. Um, there's warming centers at night, but those are only available for very limited hours, um, and they're only available at night. Um, Daybreak is actually working. Um, I, I talked with Polly about this because I was curious about the idea of a drop-in center. Um, a daytime center where people can go to get a meal, to connect them to resources, um, connect them with training, um, you know, basically somewhere they can go that's a positive alternative to jail because 
jail is a cycle and that doesn't help them and that that hurts our community um that also covers the connection of resources um maybe maybe more public events where we can connect people with resources and then uh, another big one is and, and the last one i'm sorry is um transportation and um, i did not get a chance to talk to um valley transit recently um i haven't had the opportunity to do that yet but um we used to have a bus um, and daybreak is here but the job center that's in wasilla um, public health all of that that's in wasilla um, the food pantries are in wasilla there was we have a food pantry but i mean like the rest of them um, family promise is in wasilla all of the all of a lot of the people who try to connect with people in our community are in wasilla so a lot of people if they come here they have no way of getting over there or if they have family or support structures here but resources are in wasilla there's no back and forth um, anyway i think that if we are able to approach it from a place of compassion and look at the separate issues that build up the situation that we're in now we can help more people hi i'm nancy i'm the owner of i did wash the laundromat so i see a lot of the homeless people in and out of there all the time most of them are decent but there are those that are a little rambunctious we've had to call the cops on them a couple times but my biggest thing is I don't think they know about what's available and when they need to have a place where they can go to find out what is available somewhere where they're at um, one of the ones like daybreak my house uh, one I didn't hear about was connect Palmer we work with them a lot they send homeless people to us with coupons for showers and laundry another one is uh, the school district does families in transition for kids to get showers and laundry but people don't know about these unless other people are telling them or there's somewhere they can find the information. And if any of those agencies want, they can bring the information to the laundromat and we will set up a place where people can go and strictly that's all the, they can find any agency they need to get help. And it'll be right there. I'm willing to do that because I see a lot of them in there and most of them are good people just on a bad time. Uh, I just have a question for like Daybreak and any other shelters that are in here. Uh, the main problem ones, how often have they come for you for help? So we don't have a shelter. I want to make sure we're clear. We're not a shelter. We, we're a case management agency, and I'm wanting to entertain the idea of how can we help to get people connected to resources. Because I agree, there's not a place where people can go. It, it's hard. I mean, there's Matsu Health Services in Palmer, Alaska Family Services is in Palmer. We have agencies that are there, but it's just getting people connected. So, okay, so some of the problem people, I know exactly who they are. And sometimes we'll have them come right up to our door and we're right there to help them get connected. And then it doesn't happen. And so I understand the frustration. I don't have a solution for that yet, but I know, who, I know of the people we're talking about. Is it okay if I go? I'm sorry. I'm over uh, here in the uh, corner. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, I'm, I'm, hello, everyone. I'm Ethan. I own Alaska Cell Repair in Palmer. I fix cell phones and stuff like that. Um, so I get a lot of people that come in, too, um, and I, it does make me a little nervous to help because it, my, the way my shop is set up is so small to assist a group of people can, can be tough. And then I just worry about it being like a hot spot for something else that's malicious it could be. But I just want to offer services to perhaps through a like daybreak through a vetting process, maybe we can offer services and products to help people get connected. Because I will often just have customers or people coming in say, hey, I just need to charge my phone. And they'll just be there for 10 minutes just for that. So if there's other things I can do, perhaps, I don't know how it would work, but perhaps repairing. Um, I know that I have a lot of customers that just cannot afford to get a new phone, so that's, and then that's a, a good resource, possibly. Um, Stephanie Nowers, I, I live outside the city, but I've lived here 30 years, and my kids go to Palmer High, and I'm in the city a lot, and, um, you know, I just have seen the increase, and the, the thing I'm thinking about is, is the situations that people are in, 
but also on the flip side, it doesn't take very many um, mentally unstable people, uh, violent people, to make the rest of us feel really unsafe and change our behavior. I was at the library, and for story time, there the police are moving a person away from not a violent person, but just moving them away. And I know, you know, myself just walking around town. Um, so, like, where's the balance um, is what I think about. And um, just a couple of things. Like, one thing that would be really nice just as a person is having a flyer that tells us all the resources that are out there. Because there are a ton out there. Um, maybe it could be something we could hand out, too, instead of a buck. Because um, we all know giving the money is not the right solution. And then just, I think, um, the unduly burden falls on the police and uh, the correction system. And you get folks in there. and they have mental health and drug abuse issues, and, and we're just housing them, and um, it's overloading our system. So I just wonder uh, if the chief would, um, you're having a lot of contact with these folks. Are you able to get them into respect? Like, where's the disconnect between you, you arrest them and let them know about these resources? Is there enough resources for you to, to help you with these people who are frequent flyers and, and get them out of this cycle? Yeah. I think I caught most of your question. There was a, a little bit there that I didn't understand. So I'll use the example of the nine people um, that I ran the stats on earlier. Many of those have spent many days in the last uh, year and a half in incarcerated. Um, typically, they're incarcerated less than 24 hours. Um, so I agree that that isn't necessarily a solution. To let you know a little bit what I've been doing over the last several months, I contact these people. I have told my officers that, I mean, if, if they need a ride to Wasilla to get resources, they need a ride to Anchorage, we will take them ourselves. And we've offered that to them. We've talked to them. Um, we've tried to get them set up with uh, all the other resources, Set Free Alaska, Everything we've sat down and talked with them, say, hey, look, if I can we take you somewhere? Can we work with you and uh, try to get it? And most of them are just like, nope, they do not want it. Um, at least of the, of the ones that we deal with on a daily basis. And that being said, tomorrow I'm going to ask them again. The day after that, I'm going to ask them again, and it'll continue. And hopefully one day they will, they will decide that they're they're ready. The issue that I see with these ones that are frequent flyers is they still continue to commit offenses against the public, whether it be exposing themselves, trespassing, um, being disorderly, committing assaults, that sort of thing, placing other people in fear, hurting other people, um, although that doesn't happen Super frequently, it does happen. And as as that stuff does happen, we, I mean, we're going to take appropriate action. Um, so I really don't know what the long-term solution is for, for the habitual offenders that don't want the help or not in a place today where they're ready to change or to make a help or make a difference. We see a lot of people that are homeless in their vehicle. And we contact them maybe once or twice and then never again. <clears throat> and it's because they do have like a safety net. A lot of it are a lot of them are young people that are find themselves in between, you know, they left home, they find themselves maybe kicked out of an apartment and they're figuring life out. Um, most of those have the skill. And they have the, I guess, the mental attitude to be able to get themselves out of that situation. They also have the support group to help with that. There are resources, although there are not a lot of resources here in the Valley, there are resources that are available. What we as a police department see is those that are the frequent flyers that are the systemic problem, at least today, are not at the point where they want that help. 
Does thank that you. answer thank the you. question at all? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, yeah. Chief. <clears throat> Hi. Oh. Hi, I'm Lisa Wade. I'm with Chickaloon Village Traditional Council. About five years ago, we had the similar type of problem where we were struggling with addictions, roaming uh, pretty prolific throughout uh, the Matsu Borough. And we very quickly convened a summit, much like this one, so Chunan for convening everyone. And we quickly started creating a map of resources, not just resources, but where people could plug into those resources. So this is the first step. So I haven't heard a lot of these come up. I'm going to share with you some of the ones that we created that was an outcropping of that last um, summit that we had. And there are some really great resources out here. We have Alaska Family Services, who has a treatment program, Palmer Wasilla Highway. We have uh, uh, Cook Inlet Tribal Council out here has a peer-to-peer -peer support program. We have South Central Foundation, who's now brought out the Four Directions Treatment Program. And we have, with our both of our tribal entities, both Kinnick and Chickaloon, a tribal opioid response program. And with that program, which is really a great program, it's a partnership with SAMHSA, and that program allows us to work one-on-one -on -one with individuals with whatever they really need. And so we have transportation that we provide that's on-demand service, and we work with individuals through that program, but also through our transportation programs. And the great thing about that is they're for everyone. They're not just for Alaska Native peoples. They're not for just for American Indian peoples. They're for our entire community, because we always strive to serve everyone. Um, we also offer affordable housing, and um, I think one of the greatest challenges that I've seen is um, in job creation and in offering opportunities to people. A lot of the people that we see out here, the reason they're out there is for a variety of reasons. Not, there's not one checkbox, right? So, but there's a huge one that, that we don't deal with, and it's a real challenge, and it's barrier crimes. So anyone out there that has had a barrier crime against them is virtually no housing options, limited job opportunities, and they end up on the street. So part of the solution is to create opportunities where people can work their way back into our society. And I think that's one that um, is something that, as uh, business owners, maybe you could help with. And I have young men who are homeless right now from uh, our community that did something when they were 18 years old, and they're now 30, and it's following them all along their life. They're not bad people. They made a stupid mistake. But the consequences of that will be with them for a long time. There are people that are challenging. I'm not going to lie. But you know what? We specialize in those. So send them our way. Uh, I also want to say that, um, you know, there's, there's no ideology that's going to fix this. And I think the reason I came down here tonight was, one, to share some solutions that we have. We are always opening to partnering, figure out what resources we can bring to help with this, because we want to help people wherever they're at. But I was really dismayed to see a lot of the comments, a lot of the judgment, a lot of the real vitriol that was expressed about this meeting. And so, you know, we're here with solutions and, and want to work positively. But I think really, ultimately, it starts with having a conversation with people. I love more than anything when I go to that nudie tie up there. You ever been up there? It's great food, by the way. And you go up there, and there's a lot of people up there who are experiencing housing insecurity, right? Housing insecurity. They're not homeless. They got a place to stay, but they're housing insecure. And you sit down and you have a conversation with them about, hey, how'd you get here? Where are your people from? And there's a lot of trauma and a lot of sadness that they express. There's a lot of hurt that they're carrying with them. And sometimes they just want somebody to talk to. And Chief Shelton is absolutely right. You know what? It's going to take 10, 20 times sometimes for people to get through what they need to get through to get on the right path. That doesn't mean we stop trying and just lock them up, because that doesn't work either. We know that. That's not a, it's not a solution in the long run. So anyway, um, I agree wholeheartedly. And the one thing I'm taking back from this to all the boards I serve on and all of um, our tribe and everything else is that we need a greater outreach campaign. You know, we have a really wonderful one through um, Connect Matsu, 
But you're absolutely right. If you don't have a cell phone and you don't have a way of getting a hold of anybody to contact those resources, it's going to be challenging. So we're going to try and work with um, our partners to get some flyers out into the community. And businesses, you can all spread those flyers around and give them to people and give them our contact information because we'll meet people wherever they're at to, to help them. Okay. Um, my name's Cecilia Bradford, and I sat with a group of people who couldn't be here tonight. And there's a lot of areas of concern. Each one of these individuals, and they are people, have different needs, as we've talked about. And you just gave some great, great ideas. But we need, I mean, this was amazing what you all have shared with us. And now what we need is to bring the people together from the service organizations that can come up with a plan for Palmer. Because we, we really are kind of all over the place and not collective. So there, you know, there's housing, there's safety, there's food security, there's social services, there's physical, mental health needs, criminal activity, protection. There's so many pieces to this puzzle. And in terms of the council, what is the, what is the role of the council? Where is the leadership? Perhaps you could, you know, lead this up, but it takes the service organizations to come together on this. And what is legal and what is doable and who can do what? And I really think you need to look at, <clears throat> excuse me, all the social services that are available, your churches, your nonprofits, your businesses, federal, state, there's a lot of people that need to be involved in this. I, I was born in Anchorage and raised in Palmer. When I came home retiring from my job, I was shocked at this situation because it's not the Palmer I knew. But that means we Palmerites need to come together and work on this. Um, you know what? It takes the first step. We need to find one thing that we can all agree on and focus and, and have a success and move forward. I know there was a grant done last spring for $42,000 in this arena. I don't know what happened to the money or what came out of it. Perhaps, you know, that's something we could look at and then see where we can put some more money to collectively address this issue. But I applaud you for speaking about the high school because I live just past the high school and on the railroad tracks at night, that's where they are. They're in the woods. I don't know what they're going to do this winter, but there's a lot of people in the woods around Palmer, way more than you all realize. And that is a concern, because what's going to happen to all of them? So as a, as a small town, we just need to work on this together. And that's what my group came up with. Identify one thing that's doable and get it done. Yeah, hi. Real quick, again, the uh, start at the bottom, the worst of the situations we have, and the worst of the situations are where are they going for drugs and alcohol? We're not talking about people who need mental health. We're talking about one thing we can all agree upon. We want that kind of system out of, out of our area. Bring that to a light. Where are they going? Where are they getting their drugs? Where are they taking their drugs afterwards? I hope I'm probably going to offend somebody, but the restaurant right above Fred Meyer's, the hotel slash restaurant, massive amount. Every time somebody gets money, that's where they're walking to. So what, what can we do? How can we address that? Those are issues that need to be focused. Other houses that are single houses, you know, they're being rented out. Homeowners may not even know what's going on in the place that's being rented. That needs to have a spotlight put on it. Those would be the things we could focus on right away. Okay. Um, I was loving the idea of a master list of all the resources, and then everybody else that came along that said they had something to offer with that. I was thinking to myself, what about a, a mobile resource center that could serve this area one day a week, maybe one day a month, see how popular it's going to be and move up from there? Then you would have a, a person representing the healthcare industry, where they can go for that. A person in, uh, representing the housing, um, maybe even the churches, because when we house families at our church, um, that I, can't, I think that went through Family Promise. It was a while back. 
But um, so you could have like three or four people in a mobile unit hitting at different areas of the valley with a lot of information for people. And then when they decide what area that's going to be beneficial to them the most, then you can start making uh, uh, arrangements for transportation to actually get people there. So. Uh, so my name is Ray Michelson, and um, I'm a resident of the city of Palmer here. I don't own a business downtown. However, I do share the concerns that have been brought up. Uh, I hadn't really intended to speak tonight, but I think uh, I really should uh, speak about some of the mental health resources that are coming to our community. So I work at the Matsu Health Foundation and largely do everyday grants to bolster the, the behavioral health and social services here in the Valley. Many of our grantees, including Daybreak and uh, My House and, uh, and many, many others, have really benefited from uh, the grants through the profits of the hospital. So those are health care dollars that we are looking for, places that we can make good investments. And I've heard a lot of really good ideas here, here uh, tonight. And I'm offering to, to be a conduit from the foundation to the city of Palmer through perhaps the uh, deputy mayor, whatever that might, might take. But I really want to emphasize one thing, and that is our partner in the funding here for mental health services is the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority, which is a statewide authority that is solely focused on the behavioral health, the mental health, the substance abuse, the recovery, the addictions uh, part of all of what we've been talking about tonight. We will probably always have in our community a sliver of the population that is breaking into coffee shops, trying to find money for whatever purpose. It may be driven by addictions. It simply might be driven by just simple criminal behavior. But there is a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a group of people that can really benefit from services, as I think Polly Beth has really illustrated tonight about that. And I know Jay has had wonderful opportunities to work with people who do want, it, who do want help. But well, we do have to understand, too, that there are the very frequent visitors of the hospital, of the jails, of all of our police departments and our EMS system that are driving those costs way, way up. And there's very little sometimes that we can do to affect that kind of habitual behavior. But think of all of the other people that we could help. And that's where I think it would be benefit for us to, to focus. Um, I was surprised that Mr. Smolden didn't talk about the um, – the uh, Crisis Now project that is being funded by the Mental Health Trust Authority in the Matsu Borough. And what that does is that establishes a mobile crisis team that will be dispatched through 911 and 988 through the Palmer Police Department via, uh, via their dispatch, uh, probably in about a year, that they will be able to go to a report of somebody who's sleeping, somebody who's who's using the bathroom in the alley, somebody who is drunk and unattended and can't care for themselves, a person who is clearly mentally ill, they'll be able to then get dispatched with somebody who can actually connect them more meaningfully to services. And it's called the Crisis Now Project. There's two other parts of that Crisis Now Project besides the mental health clinician workforce that is dispatched, and that's 24-7, that's not eight to five. So we know that these problems happen at all hours of the day and night, so it's going to be a 24-hour service. The other two services that will come online after that will be a 23-hour hold, and that, and that particular hold is, is a place where somebody can go less than a day and can be exposed to all sorts of help. Um, uh, we mentioned a whole lot of services over here that they can get connected with, and then there's a short-term residential program that goes along with that. Those services are coming to our borough. They're, going, they're now uh, a third of the way in Fairbanks with this project, and the fire department and EMS in Anchorage has dispatched mobile teams with APD. So we're ready to do that. The other thing I wanted to, I don't want to monopolize the mic, but I want to point out the Palmer Police Department, uh, what the chief didn't mention was the fact that the Crisis Intervention Team Academy has gone on now for about four years, and many of your officers have been trained in that 40 hour. Um, uh, uh, Shane LaCroix has been stellar at showing up at all of the Crisis Now meetings, uh, along with Todd Smolden, he's been to all of those meetings, but they weren't mentioned tonight. And those are things 
those are projects that are getting traction and they've got funding. So it's like, it's like all of these things are really lining up for the borough, which includes uh, Palmer. So I just wanted to mention that. And for others that are offering, like the cell phone gentleman back here, uh, you know, actually offering services in his shop, for, for a person who, who needs that, maybe there's something we can do to help get him connected better to uh, the um, um, uh, Connect Matsu website where you can show that person how to get help and then make a phone call to that, to, for, 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 uh, for that person. So there's a lot of things that are really brewing in our community right now, and Palmer is right at the heart of it uh, with this. So I really appreciate the, the tone and the sentiment uh, tonight about about um, helping people and not busing them to Anchorage, not putting them on an airplane, and not treating them as they're something different or subhuman than the rest of us in this room. So I just wanted to, uh, to express that. The other thing is uh, that I'll leave you with is that there is an eight-hour training that anybody can go to called Mental Health First Aid, and there's a version for uh, public safety, there's a version for EMS, there's a version for older Alaskans, there's also there's a version for kids and for teens. It, an eight-hour training that you and I could avail ourselves and we can actually help people get connected to services without having to be an expert in mental health, but it's just being aware of a person who you might suspect needs, needs that kind of help. So those services are, or rather those classes are available all over. I'm sorry, uh, the Alaska, Alaska, uh, uh, Alaska training, uh, training cooperative, Alaska training cooperative, and the Department of Education now is offering it actually next week uh, up at the um, up at the Mormon Church off of Bogard, uh, and they're looking for, and I've got a flyer for that. So there, there are a lot of things going in our community, and this is the time to really strike where the iron's hot. And the mental health, uh, excuse me, the, the Matsu Health Foundation is, you know, we're out there kind of leading it, but we're also kind of behind pushing and trying to fund things that make a difference in, in communities. And with behavioral health and addictions and the, top, the topic tonight, it's a perfect opportunity for us to, to step in and potentially partner uh, with the city and with uh, others that are in the room. So thank you. This is a crisis now. And. I really think that the, that the city council and everybody in this room really could stand a one-hour workshop on that project, and I could help facilitate that. But we really need to really understand what's headed our way and, not, uh, and, and, and really kind of have faith and believe in that and, and, and move forward with that and be part of helping to plan what it looks like in Palmer. The police are going to be at the, the very center of all of that. Uh, your dispatchers, I've spoken with both two of your dispatchers, and we have trained them on using the Connect Matsu database, which is something that dispatcher can pull up immediately when a parent calls and says, hey, I'm really worried about my son, you know, those kinds of things. They go right to that database, and they can pull up the services that are available with that. So, uh, Chief, we'd love to invite you to, to train on some of that so you know what your officers are doing and you know what your dispatch, uh, the, the problems that they're having, but the solutions that are available now and then also in the future. Okay, my name is Mike Coons. Okay, I'm going to be that vitriol. Maybe I was talked. We were talked about a little bit. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a, I'm looking at what the problem is. The problem that we're I'm hearing is we got a lot of people that got mental health issues. They got needs that are, aren't the problem. They're the ones that are those those ones in those woods that we don't see. Those are the ones that are those the ones that are really needing the help. And I agree, we need to be able to reach out to those those people and get them the help. However, we have the nine, 11, what was it, 11, 1,100 runs in the last year, in the last couple of years, 1,200, something like that, on the same nine people. They don't, you know, and like you said, they don't want help. Well, the big problem is if you got, if you got a problem, you have to identify that you got a problem, then you have to be able to have the guts to say, I need some help. As all, all of us are had that, had that same problem. But if you don't want the help, you're not going to get the help. Now you're the problem. So the, we got the problem with the nine. 
and we got problem with the drug users. Somebody was talking about the needles in there. In their, uh, the lady was talking about the feces where the kids are at. Hey, do, how many people want to have a, uh, their child or their grandchild get stuck by a needle and find out six months later they got HIV? Anybody? Anybody want to raise their hands up on that one? How about the prostitution that's going on? That place over there by Fred Myers. I think from a standpoint of a city, you had the ability to shut them down. They're a public nuisance. They're a public health risk. They're a criminal, uh, criminal problem. You got, that, you got that ability to shut them down. Uh, we're talking about phones. Oh, wait a minute. What happened to the Obama phones? Remember when Obama came out and was giving phones away? Uh, by, there, was a, there was a gentleman. I worked out at Elmendorf for several years. I, so I guess the, the big solution to me is, Chief, I back to blue 10 ways a Sunday. And I'm looking at what's happening here, and I'm looking at what's happening in the lower 48 and every place else. What, is, what, are you, what do you need from the DAs? How can we get rid of bad DAs? How can we get rid of bad judges? And so that we can make sure that when your guys go out there and bust their butts and put these people that they're not in there for 24 hours, we need them in there for 24 days or two or three months or six years or whatever to get them off the street so they're not pushing drugs, they're not putting needles in people's, uh, in people's feet and not leaving feces all over the place. That's the, that, those are the ones we need to be dealing with. Not, and we can help the other people that want help, but we we got to stop the ones that are just completely lawless and don't give a damn. I, um, yes, I, I just, I, I, I have one question. I'm sorry, I'm going to be selfish for a minute. Um, crisis now. Um, so the reason we kind of uh, called this acute is because we do have some nine individuals. I'm really, really interested in your program. Um, it, does that deal with, though, I, I'm assuming because it's called crisis, that that's, that's what this is designed. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that particular? Okay, I, yeah, I can paint a scenario very, very, very quickly. Uh, so a shop owner calls 911, and there's a person who's maybe passed out. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, so, so maybe they uh, call 911, and that's really how it begins. It could be the 988, uh, which is the new suicide, nationwide suicide crisis line. Uh, so where they can get dispatched through 988 as well, eventually. So 911 gets called, the Palmer police show up, and they, the report is that there's a person passed out in the alleyway and they may have a needle nearby or something like that. So dispatch, Palmer dispatch, and MATCOM for the rest of the borough uh, will have a decision tree in front of them about when to also send the uh, crisis clinician and the, and the peer support specialist. They would then arrive typically at the scene after the police have secured the scene. And then if it's just purely an addictions issue, if it's purely a mental health issue, then they are then uh, ready to they perhaps put that person in their car, not the police car, but the clinician's car with the peer and take them to a location where they can spend some time getting connected to services. So that's, that's in a very, very small nutshell, but as you can imagine these cases are as different as the people in our community are different. So I just wanna comment on the number of trespasses probably are not the true number because as business owners and citizens of Palmer and Alaska, we are compassionate. We take these individuals, we feed them, we house them when we see them cold. We, we have gone above and beyond many, 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 many times. I will feed them, I will give them coffee. They don't like coffee, I will give them hot chocolate. They're cold, I'll get them a hotel room. 
And I learned that from Janet Kincaid because I started working for her as a young girl. And she always told me, Lori, remember, I was young, I was 13 or 14. She said, remember, this could be somebody's daughter, this could be somebody's son. So Janet Kincaid taught me compassion and to always remember that. However, habitual situations call for serious intervention. And not only for the individual that is in that situation, but also for those that are just in the people, just us walking through a building, being an employee, not feeling threatened to go to your job. I mean, we have to take this in a whole different direction. I think we start inviting more and more situations like that. We make it comfortable here, and they will be here, and then we will have an influx in our five square mile radius. Can you imagine having that happen here? It's already enough that it creates havoc in our town, unfortunately. It's not, it's not intentional, but it's very true. You cannot run away from facts, and these are the facts. They do create situations in our small town that is unsafe, and if we start inviting more and more, it's gonna become more unsafe, and then we're gonna really be looking at a serious crisis situation. So I think we all need to take a step back, use the resources that are in Wasilla, help them get to Wasilla where they're already created, have them go to Anchorage. This summer we had a lady that was in Purple Moose parking lot, and she was, it was summer, it was hot, it was like 80 degrees. I had a friend and her husband across the street and they saw this lady and thought, oh my gosh, Lori's over there working, her door's open and this lady is approaching her door. They come over, they call me and so I go out and I look because she looked like she could have been on drugs, right? So we go out and we talk to her, we call the cops, the cops had already been intervened with her. She came up from California. She, somebody paid for her to get out here. So this is what we're looking at. So if we make it so that they're comfortable in our town, it will continue and it will become worse and worse and worse. And it's not, it's not unhumanitarian to say that. This is just the facts. So we need to figure out how to help them with the services that are here, how to get them to Wasilla where they're already at so that they can actually be more um, if you spread the resources around too much, then there's not a good solid resource. So we make the resources strong where they're at and help them get to where those resources are. There's not a one of us here that hasn't helped somebody that needs help. So I just want to make that very, very clear. We've all fed them, we've housed them, we've helped them, but it happens continually and continually. We can only do so much before it becomes a problem. So thank you. Um, so just real quickly, we're going to wrap this up very, 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 very uh shortly here. Um, thank you for, uh, for that. I, I know that um, several of us actually have, have, I call it walk in the streets because that's what, I, that's what I've done since June uh, and introducing myself to individuals um, that might be, you know, in need. Um, and it is, it is tough sometimes to approach them, but I just, you know, I would encourage you not to be afraid to approach them or to at least just ask the question. I mean, they might not respond <laughs> the way you want, and trust me, I've had those, but um, it, it's important to get to know what is happening in your city um, so that you can solve for an issue as it arises. So I'm going to let Edna speak just real quick. I'm Edna DeVries, Mayor of the Matsu Borough, and I want to tell you this is the third meeting this week that I've attended regarding homeless, and I just want to correct a couple things that was said tonight. Right now, as of at least 12 hours ago, there was no warming shelter going to be for the winter for anybody, okay? The Salvation Army is not able to continue that because they do not have a sprinkler system. So if any of you own or know somebody who does own a building with a sprinkler system in that would be uh, available for a warming shelter, then please contact the Salvation Army or myself so we can do that. The other thing, there was many questions about the resources that are available. Yesterday afternoon at our last meeting, United Way has a pamphlet that's about this square. And you unfold it, and it lists all the resources that are in the valley available for anybody that has a need. 
And so that has been taken care of. We just need to be able to get those and get those out. And like I said, it folds up so it's like this. I have one at my office that's probably this thick and eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. And so by the time you get through it, you know, the per poor person is thinking, you know, well, I don't think this person wants to help me because they're not saying anything. But anyway, just for your information on those two things that were said tonight that need to be corrected. Thank you. Thanks. Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay. Um, so clearly, again, this is not going to be the last or the last conversation that we have about this. I think that um, sometimes it, it requires, um, you know, a committee. So if anybody is willing to volunteer or to help with that, we're certainly going to consider um, putting together a committee um, in order to help make the connections, get the materials that we need, um, educate, get them out to the businesses, and help with this, with, solve for this, uh, with this issue. Did, did, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Oh, another microphone. Um, so I just wanted to mention another service that's available right in Palmer, and it's Cody, it's Compassionate Directions, and they serve mental health for 21 and under. And I think um, even to slow down the root of this problem is going to be with the kids. Um, and so they go into the schools and help with that behavioral health. And we partner with um, Matsu Health Foundation as well. And they've been very supportive there. So, um, And they're right in Palmer, right off Palmer Wasilla. So, yeah. So um, again, I we're going to go ahead and um, hit the the stop button. Um, I really appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Uh, the, this is really what we wanted to accomplish: um, is your feedback. I know that there will be more. We do have a suggestion box in the back. Uh, if you're willing to put some suggestions in there, great. Please do so. We'll be filtering through those. Uh, we'll be going through. Uh, the notes that were taken tonight, as well as the recording, uh, you were recorded. I hope you saw the sign. <laughs> so you've been notified. <laughs> but um, uh, as well, uh, please don't stop the conversation. Please continue to talk with each other about this and help us help you and communicate with us. We want to hear more from you. So thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight.